Hey guys, and welcome back. I hope that you have had a good summer break, but of course we have sick form starting if it hasn't started already for some of you. So I thought I'd go through five things that you can do to get ahead in sick form and also make sure you get those really solid grades. So first things first, let's start with efficiency. So with A-levels, you've probably heard from a million other people that it's a ton of work. Now, this doesn't actually mean that it's that difficult. It just means you have to be very efficient and you have to timetable your time. So let's start with efficiency. You probably have your timetables already and you probably notice that there are some gaps. These are free periods. You might be allowed to go home. You might not be allowed, but you need to really think to yourself, what will be most effective for work? I would recommend sticking to a normal school day. Now, I know this might sound really tedious and boring. And of course, if you have some kind of commitment, then maybe you can't do that, but I would stick to it. And the reason for this is whilst you're at school in your sick form center or in your library or whatever, you are going to be working at a much higher rate than you will at home. Let's be real, when we get home, after we've gone from a walk or a bus or whatever, we don't really want to be doing work. So if you stay for your free periods in your sick form center in silence and you just get some work done, you can be extremely efficient. So what kind of things would you need to do? Well, you have things like homework, so for every hour of class, you can expect about an hour, if not more, of homework. This might be reading a textbook for a lot of the essay subjects in biology and chemistry, or it could be kind of a bunch of maths problems. So for me, when I did A-level maths, every single lesson my teacher said, okay, this is the chapter we've just covered in the book, do all of these questions. And there was about 20, 30 plus questions. So at least an hour for every hour of class that you have to do. Other things that you can do is, of course, work on personal statements and things like that. If you are taking an additional A-level privately, and I know quite a few, few of you are because of the GCSE results and everything, then you have to also think about when you can schedule in time for that. Also keep in mind that when you get home, you should probably do at least an hour of just looking through the notes for everything that you've done in that day. Maybe if it's maths, do, an, do a question or two just to make sure you're okay. Again, even if you have all three subjects in one day, which most of you won't have, but even if you do, that should take you no more than an hour. If you only have one subject that day, 20 minutes tops just to look over your notes and that way your brain kind of condenses and consolidates everything that it's just learned and it helps with memory repetition is key for memory and learning so if you do this every single day it will help you keep on top of everything that you need to do the next thing which leads pretty much consistently off from what we just said is a schedule you need to schedule your time now i personally hate timetabling in time so I hate saying, okay, as soon as I get home from three to 4 p.m., I'm doing this, five to six doing this. I hate that. It makes me inefficient because what happens is tasks tend to take as long as you give them. So let's say if I want to read my notes for an hour when I get home from school, A, an hour, I might be too tired. I'll go, oh, really an hour, that's so long. Or B, it'll take me an hour to read the notes, even if it only takes me 20 minutes because I might be slacking. I might put on YouTube while I'm reading them, in which case I'm probably not reading them very well. Instead, what I prefer to do is set tasks for every day. And that way, it doesn't matter how long it takes. So if my task is read notes for that day, some days it might take me 20 minutes. And cool, that means I get a bit longer of a break. Perfect. Some days it might take me an hour to get used to exactly what was going on. Maybe I don't understand it. Maybe I need to look up some YouTube videos or something. That's fine too. But the task gets done. Now, this also means that you have to set yourself a reasonable number of tasks. Don't set five different tasks when you get home from school it's just a mental block. You're going to look at that and think, yeah, I'm not doing any of that. So be realistic, which means you can change your schedule over time. Okay. Let's say in the first week, you probably don't have many notes to record. A lot of um, the first week will be, okay, this is an introduction to A-level maths or physics or psychology or whatever. Here's what we're going to do. Here's what's expected of you. So over the weeks, this may change. And of course, when you come up to exam time, it's going to change your priorities, but have some kind of schedule and change it maybe on a monthly basis or a termly basis. Now, with the schedule, the other thing you want to schedule in is exactly what you know by what week. So what do I mean by that? Well, every week you're going to learn a certain topic at school, right? Now going over the notes, that's cool. However, I would point this out, and I've pointed this out a few times before, schools do not always finish all of the content. Sometimes they rush, sometimes they don't get enough exam practice done, sometimes they skip entire things. So for example, paper three, A-level maths, the stats and mechanics, is usually heavily neglected. Now again, your school might be different, it might be a superstar, or it might be even worse than what I'm saying. So you have to base it on your specification. Pull up your spec, and there is a literal checklist of everything you need to know. There is a list of topics. Schedule those in, count how many topics you have, count and then assign them for different weeks. 
Maybe you do a topic every single week. And that way, if it's a short topic, you have a lighter week, that's good. Maybe it's a harder topic, you spend a bit longer on it. Cool, all fine. So for example, with maths, there's around 32 overall topics. So in theory, you could take 32 weeks to learn it all. Again, you need to practice it, you need exam practice, etc. So that isn't actually that long. That's more than what year 12 is going to be. So keep that in mind. Base it on the specification, not on what your school's doing. Just so you're completely aware of how far along you are. If you schedule it in that you have to do a topic every single week and you know that by next December you finished all of the content, you will know that for sure. You don't have to rely on a school telling you. In which case, December all the way to June, you're just doing exam practice. Nice and juicy, okay? So base it on specification. Number three, revise for every single mini test as well as every single main test. Now, you're going to have a ton of tests. Why? Because schools want to A, encourage you to revise more, and B, they want to know if you're keeping up with the workload. If you're not, they might ask you to change A-levels, they might ask you to drop the fourth A-level, it could be anything. And when I say ask, it kind of means force, because let's be real, you know, they don't, they just won't enter you for the exam, right, period. So, the reason why rising for mini tests is really good is it allows you to have a progress check. If you know, I mean, again, I'm going to use maths as an example for this, but if you know you have a test on partial fractions coming up, and you flop it, then you know you need to revise partial fractions. Treat it as if it's the real thing. Study hard for it. Aim to get 100%. Aim for per perfection, but settle for excellence is the kind of goal that you want to uh, kind of leave. If you aim for 100%, but you get 90%, that's still pretty damn good. Not just that, but they can also lead to predicted grades. Now, mostly your mocks are going to determine your pr predicted grades, but if for whatever reason mocks are cancelled like they were a few years back because of COVID, that might be the grade that you end up getting, that might be the predicted grade you end up getting, and I want to point this out one more time, predicted grades are pretty much as important, if not more so, than your actual final year exams, because they determine what universities you can apply to in the first place. So, revise every single mini test. It keeps you up with your revision, it gives you good practice, and it lets you know what bits you're struggling with, which is gold. Data is gold, okay? If you know that this topic is particularly difficult, how are you gonna know that unless you get tested, okay? So revise every single mini test, as well as all the main ones, to keep up with all of, all of the workload. Number four, we're finally taking a break from scheduling and we're going to talk about taking up your school on offers of extracurriculars. So schools, especially in sixth form, will offer all sorts of things. It could be university open days, it could be code camps, it could be engineering schemes. So I personally did the EES, Engineering Education Scheme, kind of weirdly named, but essentially we got paired with actual engineering firms. So I got um, paired with British Petroleum and we solved an issue through an engineering issue. For me, it was like pipes down at the bottom of the sea and all of that kind of fun stuff. And we're paired with a real life engineer. So that is really key experience. It might lead to work experience or an internship, but it looks really good on a CV. Again, with medicine, they can pay up pharmacists and doctors and um, dentists, etc. But there are also other things for everyone else too. Creative writing, for example. Lots of different extracurriculars they're going to offer you. There's even an, usually an officer in the school that is solely dedicated to your career. So their whole aim, their whole purpose in life is to make sure you get offered enough things to do to make your personal statement look really nice. Use them, talk to them all the time. Say, hey, I wanna do optometry. Hey, I wanna do insurance. Hey, I wanna do law. Find me some stuff, please. Please and thank you, of course, but find me some stuff. And they will go out and find stuff for you. This way, you don't have to rely on yourself or rely just on your grades because, again, if you haven't watched the video before, grades are not what get you into university 99% of the time, okay? Everyone that applies to your university has the same grades, so that's not what's going to count. So, last but not least, take up offers of extracurriculars. It might be really tedious, it might be really boring, but it's, very, it's a very small thing you can do to improve your personal statement. That being said, take notes when you do this. My one regret is that on the engineering education scheme, I didn't write down everything I was doing. If I did, I could have had an even better personal statement. And lastly but not least, I feel like I rag on teachers quite a lot. Ironic, I know, because I am a teacher, but ask teachers for advice. Nine times out of 10, your physics teacher has done a physics-based degree. Your maths teacher has done a maths-based degree. Your law teacher has done a law-based degree. They've done what you want to do. 
at least in terms of the degree. Okay, some of them may even have work experience of what you want to do. I've had ex PhD people like doctors and professors teach me biology. I've had ex engineers teach me physics. So these people are just diamonds to talk to. So get close to your teachers, talk to them, ask them for advice. It could be advice on studying. It could be advice on what you want to do in the future. It could be advice on what you can do as extracurriculars. They probably have some kind of information that's useful to you. And of course, that means you can also ask other teachers. Let's say if you're doing maths and there's five math teachers, ask all of them, say, hey, I want to go into some kind of tax related thing, accountancy. Do you have any advice? Oh, I did accountancy at university. I even worked there for a few years. There you go. You now have a wealth of information that you can use. And even they can help write your personal statement for you, as in your reference. Now, if you're applying for accountancy and you have an accountant writing your reference, that's a pretty good reference. Instead of having someone that might not know you very well, it could be your form tutor, for example. They know you well, but let's say your uh, form tutor is an ex-medical student and you want to go into engineering. Not that much overlap. It's not as impressive as, let's say, a medical student and you're applying to do medicine. You know, those things go hand in hand. So speak to your teachers, talk to them, ask them for advice, find out what they did at university, find out what they did before teaching, etc., etc., etc. But yeah, asking adults for advice, people have already done what you want to do or have done something similar, is extremely, extremely useful, okay? And to be honest, your teachers are going to be a lot more open to speaking to you now in sixth form than they were ever before because you guys are more on the same level in the sense that you guys are becoming adults. So they do treat you with a little bit more leniency and they're more willing to talk to you about these things. So even those mean teachers will tend to not be as mean <laughs> in sixth form. Anyways, I hope that you found these useful, one of these five kind of tips. I would recommend you do all of them, of course. But let me know if you have any other tips in the comments and let me know if you found any of these useful. But other than that, I will let you get on with your day. I hope you have a wonderful day and I'll see you in the next one.